Make Everything Flow in Your Favor, The Little Blue Book, Connie Mendez. Dive into the captivating world of Connie Mendez's Little Blue Book, a guide urging a simple truth. Metaphysical wisdom needs more than just a quick look. It craves revisiting. Written in penny words, this gem goes beyond mental barriers, unfolding understanding with each read. No heavy lifting required. The magic lies in reading until it becomes second nature. Slip this booklet in your pocket, keep it by your bedside, and explore chapters like Dynamic Christianity and The Mechanics of Thought. Speak your truths, move mountains with faith, and explore the heart of love. May this journey guide you like a compass to the pages meant for your curious soul. The Little Blue Book by Connie Mendez contains a valuable warning. Every metaphysical book should be read many times. Each time you revisit it, you'll understand it better. However, what truly stays with us is what we practice, not just what we read and leave unused. This little book is written in what the author calls penny words, meaning it's expressed in the simplest terms. The intention is for it to be understandable to anyone seeking the truth of God, even if they lack the background to digest psychology and metaphysical texts as they are originally written in Spanish. Whenever we encounter something new or unfamiliar, it awakens dormant cells in our brains. The second time we come across that new idea, we grasp it a bit better. Our brain cells start working on it, and soon a light bulb goes off in our minds. We accept the idea and put it into practice automatically. This is how we awaken, learn, evolve, and progress. No superhuman effort is required to implant ideas in our heads. It's a natural process, but we must be willing to reread, reread, and reread until what we've learned becomes automatic. So carry a copy of this booklet in your purse or pocket and keep another by your bedside. Read it often especially when faced with problems or distressing situations. Something incredible will happen. The booklet will open to the page you need to consult, and you'll think, this seems like it was written just for me. As Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Metaphysics is one of these mansions, a study of mental and spiritual laws that doesn't interfere with spiritualism. Another mansion in the Father's house, May this little work bring you the peace and prosperity it has brought to so many others. Blessings to you. Chapter 1. Dynamic Christianity Before embarking on any endeavor, a candidate typically receives instructions or studies its techniques. Yet some dive into the task of living blindly, without guidance, technique, or direction. They're like a person who starts a journey without knowing what life is, why some lives are filled with abundance and contentment, while others are marked by poverty and suffering. Some are born into privileged circumstances, showered with love, and still, they are haunted by misfortunes. Humanity is left guessing, often with wrong assumptions, and death arrives without them grasping the truth. Learn this profound truth, what you think you manifest. Thoughts are things, and it's your attitude that shapes everything that happens to you. Your perception extends not only to your body and character, but also externally, influencing your material conditions. Yes, as unbelievable as it sounds, thoughts are indeed things. Now, if you have the habit of thinking that you have a sound constitution, whatever you do, it will always be healthy. But if you change your way of thinking and allow the fear of illness to creep in, you'll start to fall ill, losing your health. If you were born into wealth, you might always be prosperous unless someone convinces you that destiny exists and makes you believe that yours can change with the ups and downs. Because it's your belief, your life, and what happens to you all follow your beliefs and what you express in words. This is a law, a principle. Do you know what a principle is? It's an unchanging law that never fails. This law is called the principle of mentalism. If the idea that accidents await us at every turn is deeply rooted in your mind, if you believe that the ailments of old age are inevitable, if you're convinced of your good or bad luck, whatever you normally expect for better or worse, that's the condition you'll see manifest in your life and in everything you do. 
that's the reason for what happens to you. You're never conscious of the ideas that fill your mind. They're formed based on what we're taught or what we hear. Since most of us are unaware of the laws governing life, laws known as the laws of creation, we spend our lives creating conditions to the contrary. We watch as what promised to be good turns bad, stumbling in the dark without a compass or a rudder, blaming life itself and learning through trial and error or attributing it to the will of God. From what you've read so far, you've probably realized that humans aren't what we've been led to believe, mere driftwood in a storm, tossed here and there by the waves. Their life, their world, their circumstances, it's all their creation and no one else's. They are the rulers of their own empire. They are the kings of their empire. If their opinion is that they're no more than driftwood in a storm, so be it. They believed it and they allowed it. To be born with free will means being created with the individual right to choose. To choose what to think, negatively or positively. To be pessimistic or optimistic. To dwell on the ugly and the bad and what it brings forth. Or to focus on the good and the beautiful and the positivity it generates, both externally and internally. Metaphysics has always taught that what we often think penetrates the subconscious and takes root there, acting as a reflection. Modern psychology has finally uncovered this when a human finds themselves entangled in the consequences of their ignorance, meaning that they've brought a calamity upon themselves. They turn to God and plead for relief from suffering. Sometimes God answers, and at other times, inexplicably, he does not. In the latter case, their loved ones console them, saying one must resign themselves to God's will. In other words, everyone takes for granted that the Creator's will is unkind. But simultaneously, religion teaches that God is our Father, a Father of boundless kindness, love, mercy, wisdom, and eternity. Notice how these two theories don't align. Does it make sense that an infinitely loving wise father could harbor ill will and express it toward his children? We mortal parents could never attribute the crimes we attribute to God to any child. We wouldn't be capable of condemning a creature of our own blood to eternal fire for a natural flaw of their mortal condition. And yet, we consider that God is capable. Essentially, even without realizing it, we're attributing to God a nature of a capricious, vengeful magnate filled with ill will, ready to inflict punishments far beyond proportion at the slightest transgression. This way of thinking is natural when we are born, living in ignorance of the fundamental rules and laws of life. As we've already mentioned, we create our own calamities with our thoughts. This is because we are made in the image and likeness of the Creator. We are creators, each of our own manifestation. Now, why does it seem that God answers sometimes and not others? You'll see, prayer is the purest and loftiest thought one can have. It polarizes the mind to the highest positive degree, emitting vibrations of light when we pray, that is, when we think of God. These vibrations should instantaneously transform all surrounding dark conditions into perfect and beautiful ones, just like bringing a lamp into a dark room. Whenever the one praying thinks and believes that the God they are addressing is a loving father who desires to bestow all that is good upon his child, God always answers. But generally, humanity has the habit of praying like this. Oh God, get me out of this trouble. I know you think it's not good for me because you want to test me. In other words, they've already denied any possibility of receiving help. They have more faith in a God they were taught to be capricious, vengeful, and full of ill will, who is just waiting for us to commit the first infraction so he can inflict punishments of satanic cruelty, because one who prays like this only receives according to their own image of God. It's as simple as I'm telling you. Never forget again that God's will for you is goodness, health, peace, and happiness. Happiness, well-being, all the good that He has created, Never forget that God is neither the judge, nor the police, nor the executioner, nor the tyrant that you've been led to believe. The truth is that He has created seven laws, seven principles that govern everything, always at work, without a single moment of rest. These laws are responsible for maintaining order and harmony throughout creation. In the realm of the Spirit, there is no need for police. 
Whoever acts outside the law punishes themselves. What you think manifests. So, learn to think correctly, in alignment with these laws, and manifest all the good that God desires for you. St. Paul once said that God is closer to us than our own feet, hands, and even closer than our breath. That's why we don't have to shout for Him to hear us. Simply thinking about Him starts to bring order to what seems disarrayed. He created us and knows us better than we know ourselves. He understands why we act the way we do and doesn't expect us to behave as saints when we're just learning to walk on this spiritual journey. I urge you not to accept everything I'm telling you without verifying it. It's your divine and sovereign right not to do what you've done so far. Accept everything you hear and see without giving yourself the chance to discern between what's right and wrong. Chapter 2. The Mechanics of Thought Throughout the day and night, we constantly think about a myriad of different things, like an unconnected, continuous cinematic reel passing through our minds. Among these various ideas, we stop to contemplate, examine, or study some more than others. Why? Because they trigger our emotions, provoking feelings of fear, sympathy, or antipathy, liking or disliking. Regardless, it's the feeling that captures our interest. We revisit it later and maybe even discuss it with someone. This is meditation, and what's meditated upon sinks into the subconscious, imprinting itself. Once an idea is imprinted in the subconscious, it becomes a reflex. Just like when a doctor taps your knee with an object, it jerks. You were touched in a sensitive spot, and you reacted. Similarly, whenever something in your life references one of the ideas engraved in your subconscious, the reflex reacts exactly as it was imprinted. You adopt an attitude in line with the original emotion you felt when you first thought of that idea. Metaphysicians call this a concept, meaning a belief or conviction. The subconscious doesn't reason, decide, or have opinions. It doesn't think for itself and lacks the power of protest or its own will. These aren't its functions. Its sole function is to react, setting in order the reflex it's been given. It's an amazing automatic archiver, secretary, and librarian that never rests or fails. It lacks a sense of humor and doesn't know when an order is given in jest or seriousness. So if you have a slightly prominent nose and for a laugh, you jokingly call it your stuffed potato nose, for example, the subconscious, being a precise servant devoid of humor, will unconditionally try to carry out the command embedded in your words and feelings. You'll notice how your nose gradually starts resembling a stuffed potato. The word metaphysical means beyond the physical, the science that studies and deals with everything that's invisible to our physical senses. It provides answers for all that we don't understand, all that's mysterious. As you read this booklet, you'll see how it's precise and accurate. Do you remember the first time you heard the word cold? You were very young. Your elders mentioned it and taught you to fear it. By repeated exposure, they helped you understand it. They advised you not to wet your feet, not to stand in a draft or get too close to someone with a cold and so on. All of this was imprinted in your subconscious, becoming a reflex. You never had to recall your elders' warnings. The damage was done. From then on, your subconscious would make you catch a cold whenever you stood in a draft, got your feet wet, or came near someone with a cold. Even when you heard about a flu or cold epidemic, it was because of what you heard from others, read in newspapers, or saw in radio and TV ads. Most importantly, because you were unaware of the metaphysical truth of life, you accepted these false ideas. They have become reflexes, acting automatically without your premeditation, and are the root cause of all the troubles in your life. You carry a hefty load of misguided ideas that affect every aspect of your life, from your body to your soul and your mind. Keep in mind that had you not accepted these negative beliefs, exercising your right to free will by choosing to accept or reject them, germs, viruses, or any other power in the world wouldn't have been able to convince your subconscious to act any other way than what you dictated. Your positive or negative will is the magnet that draws towards you germs, adverse circumstances, or good ones. As we've mentioned before, 
Your negative or positive attitude towards events determines their effects on you. Chapter 3. The Foolproof Formula It turns out that every human mind contains a mass of opinions, convictions, or erroneous concepts that contradict the truth and clash with the fundamental principles of creation. These false beliefs perpetually manifest as external conditions, bringing all the calamities and suffering that afflict mankind and the world in general. Illnesses, accidents, ailments, disputes, disharmony, shortages, failures, and even death. Fortunately, none of this aligns with the truth of being. Luckily, there's a way to erase all these false beliefs and replace them with correct ones. These correct beliefs not only produce positive, good, happy, and right conditions and circumstances, but once the error is corrected and the truth established in the subconscious, negative things cannot happen again in our lives. The order has been changed. The magnet has reversed its polarity. It's absolutely impossible to attract something that doesn't already have its correspondence within us. The foolproof formula is as follows. Every time something undesirable happens to you, be it sickness, an accident, theft, offense, annoyance, or when you cause harm to someone else or yourself, when you're afflicted by a physical, moral, or character defect. If someone dislikes you or if you dislike them, if you suffer from excessive love or jealousy, if you fall in love with someone who belongs to another or if you're a victim of injustice or the domination of another, the list is endless. Remind yourself of the condition that's affecting you. Know the truth. As Jesus Christ, the greatest of all metaphysical teachers, said, Know the truth and it shall set you free. The truth, the supreme law, is perfect harmony, beauty, goodness, justice, freedom, health, intelligence, wisdom, love, and bliss. Everything to the contrary is appearance. It goes against the supreme law of perfect harmony, and therefore it's a lie because it contradicts the truth of yourself. The higher self is perfect in this moment and always has been perfect. It cannot get sick because it is life. It cannot die for the same reason. It cannot age. It cannot suffer. It cannot fear. It is beauty, love, intelligence, wisdom, and bliss. This is the truth, your truth, my truth, and the truth of all human beings. And right now, it's not that the human being is God, just as a drop of seawater is not the sea but it encompasses everything that forms and contains the sea to an infinitesimal degree. For an atom, that drop of water is a whole sea. Anything you're manifesting, anything happening to you that goes against perfect harmony, or anything you're doing or suffering, contrary to perfect harmony, is due to a mistaken belief that you've created. You know it, and you're reflexively projecting it outward and attracting its likeness from the outside. It has nothing to do with your higher self. It remains perfect. Your conditions and your situation are perfect now. In all the circumstances listed earlier, you must remember what I just told you. First, firmly say mentally or aloud, as you prefer, I don't accept it. Say it with determination, but with infinite gentleness. Mental work doesn't require physical force. Neither thought nor spirit has muscles. When you say, I don't accept it, do it as if you were saying, I don't feel like it. Calmly, but with the same conviction and determination, without shouting, violence, or abrupt movements. After saying, I don't accept it, remember that your higher self is perfect, that its conditions are perfect. Then say, I declare that the truth of this problem is harmony, love, intelligence, justice, abundance, life, health, etc. Whatever is opposed to the negative condition manifesting at that moment. Thank you, Father, for hearing me. You don't have to blindly believe what you read. You must verify it for yourself. In metaphysical language, this is called a treatment. After any treatment, you must maintain the attitude you've declared. Doubt about the effectiveness of the treatment must not be allowed to creep in. Also, you can't express the previous concepts, opinions, and beliefs in words because that destroys and nullifies the treatment. The purpose is to transform the mental pattern that has been dominating your subconscious, that is, the mental climate in which you've been living with all your negative circumstances. As St. Paul said, you are transformed by the renewal of your mind. This renewal is achieved by changing every old belief as it presents itself to our life or our consciousness 
in conscious disagreement with the truth. There are convictions so deeply rooted that they are what metaphysics calls crystallization. These require more work than others, but every denial and affirmation made regarding these crystallizations erases the original design until it disappears completely, leaving nothing but the truth. You'll see miracles happening in your life, in your environment, and in your conditions. You don't have defects. They are mere appearances of defects. What you perceive as moral or physical defects are temporary. As you come to know the truth of your true self, your Christ, your higher self, a perfect child of God, made in the likeness of the Father, these imperfections that you present to the world start to fade away. This is a verifiable fact that any student of Christian metaphysics can confirm. This is the great truth. Never forget it and start practicing it right now. The more you practice, the more it will manifest, the further you'll progress, and the happier you'll feel. Remember, you are unique, just like your fingerprints. You were created with a unique design for a special purpose that only you can fulfill. It has taken you 14,000 years to evolve to where you are today. The expressions of God are infinite. You and I are just two of those infinite expressions. Your Christ is an intelligent being who loves you intensely and has been waiting for centuries for you to recognize him. The time has come. Speak to him, ask him, and await his responses. He is your only guide and teacher. When you understand, accept, and realize this truth, it will be the birth of Christ within you. This is what's prophesied for this era. He is the Messiah. It's not that Jesus is born again. It's that everyone will find Christ in their consciousness and heart, just as it happened to Jesus. That's why they called him Jesus Christ. Chapter 4. The Decree. Every spoken word is a decree that manifests externally. The word is spoken, thought. Jesus said two things that haven't been taken seriously enough. For by your words you will be condemned, and by your words you will be justified. This doesn't mean that others will judge us by what we say, although that is also true, as you may have seen. The teacher was teaching metaphysics, but the race was not yet mature enough to comprehend it. He often warned that there were many other things he wanted to say, but they couldn't be understood. On other occasions, he said, it's not what enters the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of their mouth, because what comes out of the heart is what matters. This can't be expressed more clearly. I suggest you pay attention to everything you declare in a single day. Let us remind you, business is going poorly, things are so bad, the youth is lost, traffic is impossible, service is unbearable. You can't get service. Don't let that reel run, or thieves will steal it. Thieves are everywhere. I'm afraid to go out. Be careful, you might fall. Or someone might kill you. A car might run you over. You might break something. I'm so unlucky. I can't eat that. It will harm me. My bad memory, my allergies, my headaches, my rheumatism, my poor digestion. That's a bandit. That's a wretch. It must be. When it happens, don't be surprised or complain, because by expressing it, you have decreed it. You've given an order that must be fulfilled. Now remember and never forget, every word you utter is a positive or negative decree. If it's positive, it manifests good. If it's negative, it brings forth harm. If it's against your neighbor, it's the same as if I decreed it against you. It will come back to you. If you're kind and understanding towards others, you'll receive kindness and understanding from them. When something unpleasant happens to you, don't say, I didn't think or fear this. Be sincere and humble enough to try to remember the terms in which you expressed yourself about another person. And when that old, deeply rooted concept emerged from your heart, which may be nothing more than a social habit like the ones mentioned earlier, and which you genuinely don't wish to continue using, as the feeling accompanying a thought is more firmly imprinted in the subconscious, Jesus, the teacher who never used unnecessary words, expressed it well. What comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. This gives us the unequivocal key. The first feeling it teaches us is fear. First, our parents teach it to us, and then our religious teachers. When we feel fear, our heart races. We often say, my heart is about to jump out of my mouth to show the level of fear we're experiencing at a given moment. 
Fear is behind all the negative phrases I mentioned earlier. St. Paul said, We are transformed by the renewal of our mind. Every time you find yourself uttering a negative sentence, you'll know what kind of erroneous concept is rooted in the subconscious, and you'll know what kind of feeling it obeys, fear or lack of love. Cross it out, erase it, and deny it as a lie. Affirm the truth if you don't want it to continue manifesting in your external world. After a short period of practicing this, you'll notice that your way of speaking is different, your way of thinking is different, and you and your whole life will be transformed by the renewal of your mind. When you're in meetings with other people, you'll become acutely aware of the kind of concepts they hold, and you'll notice it in everything that happens to them. Whenever you hear negative conversations, don't affirm anything they express. Think, I don't accept it for myself or for them. There's no need to tell them. It's better not to disclose the truth you're learning. Not because you have to hide it, but because there's an occult maxim that says, when the disciple is ready, the master appears. By the law of attraction, anyone prepared to advance to the next level automatically draws closer to the one who can help them advance. So don't try to be a catechist. Don't force anyone to receive lessons of truth, as you may find that those you thought were the most willing are the least sympathetic to it. This is what Jesus meant when he said, Do not give what is holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Chapter 5. Moving Mountains with Faith Everyone knows the saying, faith can move mountains, and they often repeat it like parrots, but they don't truly understand what it means, why it's said, or how faith can move mountains. Few people realize that fear can also move mountains. Fear and faith are two sides of the same force. Fear is negative, the conviction that bad things will happen. Faith is the conviction that what will happen is good or will end well. Fear and faith are two sides of the same coin. Notice that you never fear something good happening, and you never have faith that bad things will occur. Faith is always associated with something we desire, and I believe you don't wish harm upon yourself, do you? Everything you fear, you attract and experience. Now when it does happen, you often say triumphantly, I knew it, I felt it, and rush to tell everyone repeating it as if you wanted to show off your clairvoyant powers. In reality, you thought it with fear, you felt it, and you said it yourself. You know that everything you think and feel simultaneously with an emotion is what manifests or attracts. You anticipated it, and you expected it. Anticipating and expecting is faith. Now, consider that everything you expect with faith comes to you and happens. So, if you know this to be true, what's stopping you from using faith for everything you desire? Love, money, health, and so on. It's a natural law, a divine ordinance. Christ taught this with the following words, which you already know. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer believing, ye shall receive. I didn't make it up. It's in Matthew 21, 22. And Mark expresses it even more clearly. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. St. Paul says it with words that have no other interpretation. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I will tell you that this conviction comes from knowledge. Let's say you live in the province and have never been to the capital. You want to go to the capital, and you take the train, car, or plane. You know where the capital is and how to get there. On the way, you don't fear ending up on the moon, do you? If you were a savage, you'd be trembling with fear because you have no idea what's happening. But if you're a civilized person, you'll go peacefully, knowing that you will arrive in the capital at a specific time. It's knowledge. Ignorance of the principles of creation is what makes the world fear evil and not know how to use faith or even what faith is. It's conviction, certainty, but it has to be based on knowledge. You know that the capital exists and that you're headed there. That's why you know you won't end up on the moon. Now, if you want something and fear not getting it, you won't get it. If you deny it before receiving it 
as in the example of the prayer directed to God by most humans. My God, grant me such and such, even though I know you won't give it to me because you'll think it's not good for me. You won't get it because you've denied it in advance. You've confessed that you don't expect it. Let me give you the metaphysical formula for getting what you desire. It's a formula that should be used for everything. Try it for yourself. Don't blindly believe me. Say, I desire such a thing, in harmony for everyone, and in accordance with divine will, under grace and in a perfect way. Thank you, Father, for having heard me. Now, don't doubt for a moment. You've used the magic formula, fulfilled the whole law, and you won't have to wait long to see your desire manifested. Have patience. The longer you wait, the sooner you'll see results. Impatience, tension, and mental insistence destroy the treatment. The formula is what metaphysics calls a treatment. By repeating the formula, I'll explain the process in detail. By saying in harmony for everyone, you've removed all danger of your good interfering with others' well-being. In the same way you don't wish harm to others, by saying, in accordance with divine will, you ensure that if what you desired was less than perfect for you, something much better will happen than you expected. In this case, it means that what you were desiring wasn't going to be good enough or as good as you thought. God's will is perfect. When you say, under grace and in a perfect way, it contains a wonderful secret. Let me give you an example of what happens when you don't know how to ask under grace and in a perfect way. A lady urgently needed a sum of money and asked for it every 15th of the month. She had absolute faith that she would receive it. However, her selfishness and indifference did not inspire her to ask with consideration for others. The next day, a car accident injured her daughter, and on the 15th of the month, she received the exact sum she had asked for. Her insurance company denied her claim for her daughter's accident. She had turned the law against herself. Asking under grace and in a perfect way means working with the spiritual law. In the spiritual plane, everything is perfect, without hindrance, obstacle, inconvenience, stumbling, harm to anyone, struggle, or effort. Everything flows smoothly with great love, and that is our truth. When you know this truth, it makes you free. Thank you, Father, for having heard me, is the highest expression of faith we can hold. Jesus taught it and applied it. From breaking the bread to feed 5,000 to turning water into wine, as you can see, everything Jesus taught was metaphysical. Everything you desire, everything you need, can be manifested. The Father has already foreseen and given everything, but you have to ask as you feel the need. Just remember, you can't ask for harm to come to another, as it will come back to you. And what you ask for yourself, you should ask for all of humanity, because we are all children of the same Father. For instance, when you make requests, ask for great things. The Father is abundant and doesn't appreciate stinginess. Don't say, Father God, give me a small house. I only ask for a small house. Even if your family is large and you actually need a much bigger house, you'll only receive what you ask for. Instead, say, Father, grant to me and all of humanity all the wonders of your kingdom. Now, to strengthen your faith, Create a list of the things you want or need. List the objects or items. Alongside this list, create another one, enumerating the things you want to disappear either within yourself or externally. On the same paper, write the formula I provided earlier. Read your list every night and don't allow the slightest doubt. Give thanks whenever you think about what you've written. When you see the things on your list fulfilled, cross them out. When you've crossed out all of them, don't be ungrateful, thinking that maybe they would have happened anyway. They happened because you asked correctly, and the external world adjusted to let them happen. As you're accustomed to feeling fear for various reasons, every time you're attacked by fear, repeat the following formula that will erase the reflex imprinted in your subconscious. I have no fear. I don't want to have fear. God is love and in all of creation, there's nothing to fear. I have faith. I want to feel faith. A great teacher used to say, the only thing to fear is fear itself. Repeat the formula even when you're trembling with terror. At that moment, it's even more crucial. 
The desire not to fear and the desire to have faith are enough to nullify all the effects of fear and place us in the positive pole of faith. You're probably familiar with the psychological principle that says when a habit is erased, it must be replaced with another. Whenever an idea crystallized in the subconscious is negated or rejected, a little void is created. This void must be filled immediately with an opposing idea, otherwise the void will attract ideas of the same kind, constantly suspended in the atmosphere, thought by others. Gradually, you'll see your fears disappear if you have the will to be consistent in repeating the formula in all circumstances. You'll gradually notice that only the things you desire will happen to you. By their fruits ye shall know them, Jesus said. This great instrument, the power of decree, is presented to us in the extraordinary account of creation in the first two chapters of Genesis in the Bible. I suggest you take some time to read this wonderful story. As you read, you'll realize that man, that is, you and I, were not created to be fixed pieces of circumstances, victims of conditions, or puppets controlled by powers beyond our dominion. On the contrary, man occupies the pinnacle of creation. Far from being the most insignificant thing in the universe, man, by the very nature of the powers bestowed by the Creator, is the supreme authority designated by God to govern the earth and all created things. Man is endowed with the same powers as the Creator because he is made in his image and likeness. Man is the instrument through which wisdom, love, life, and the power of the creative spirit are fully expressed. God placed man in a receptive and obedient universe, including his body, his affairs, his environment, which has no alternative but to carry out the decrees of his supreme authority. The power to decree is absolute in man. The dominion God gave him is irrevocable. However, man has occupied himself with declaring his world to be good or bad, and his experiences have been in line with his beliefs. This clearly demonstrates how the universe responds and how comprehensive and transcendent the authority and dominion of man are. Chapter 6. Love the first principle of creation, the principle of mentalism, whose motto is, All is Mind, is the key to completing your knowledge. As Jesus said, Ye are gods, John 10.34. Just as all of creation is a thought manifested, man who is a god in potential creates everything he sees in equality and likeness with his creator. You've also learned the mechanics of this mental creation, whether it's positive or negative, the force of faith or fear that determines its character and how to change the external appearance of what you've created. You've learned the power of the spoken word, which is thought expressed and thus confirms the orders you've given with your thoughts. Lastly, you've been given the infallible formula to create, manifest and obtain the best, the highest, the perfect, to know the truth in obedience to the Master Jesus' command. You know that this truth is that we were created perfect by a perfect creator with his perfect essence, with free will to fulfill our desires, positively or negatively create, and thus evil is not a creation of God. It has no power against the truth. That vanishes when we replace it with positive thoughts and words, as Jesus said, do not resist evil, Matthew 5, 39. In other words, we should overcome evil with goodness. The only truth is goodness. From now on, you can no longer blame anyone for what happens to you. You must look in the mirror and ask yourself, was my mental attitude positive or negative in this situation? Did I feel fear or discomfort? What kind of declarations did I make with my words? You must be honest and answer the truth. Are you content with what you see or does it displease you? In Christian metaphysics, we say that God has seven aspects, love, truth, life, intelligence, soul, spirit, and principle. All these aspects are invisible states, which means that everything is mental. We cannot see or touch them, but we can feel and appreciate their effects. They exist, they act, they are real, and none of them can be denied. Love is called the character of God, the first aspect of God, the most powerful of all forces and the most sensitive. Few people truly understand what love is. Most believe it's what they feel towards their parents, children, spouses, lovers, etc. 
Affection, fondness, attraction, antipathy, and hatred are different degrees of the same thing. Emotion. Love is very complex and cannot be defined with a single word. On our planet, love is understood as a sensation. Even though this is just the outer edge of love, let's try to bring this sensation as close as possible to love to start understanding it. At the center of the scale that goes from hatred to emotion, which we call love, lies tolerance and goodwill. It may seem contradictory, but when you love too much, tolerance and goodwill are lacking. The same is true when you hate. In other words, excessive love or excessive hatred both deny tolerance and goodwill. As Jesus said, peace to men of goodwill, which implies that anything beyond goodwill does not bring peace. Peace is at the center, the perfect balance, neither too much nor too little. Excess in everything, even excess of goodness, excess of money, excess of love, charity, prayer, sacrifice, etc., disrupts the balance, tilting the scale. When Genesis says, of all the fruits of the paradise you may eat, except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it precisely refers to this. The tree trunk symbolizes the center, the balance from which branches extend in all directions and bear fruits. Some manifest as good, others as evil, symbolizing extremes. So, the forbidden fruit that has caused so much trouble in the world is nothing but extremes, excessive in all aspects, because God, who created everything, declared His work good. Read it in Genesis, and it only mentions the word evil concerning excess. Let me pause to recommend that you read and meditate on Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which starts with, To everything there is a season. Returning to love, mothers who claim to love their children so much that they won't let them leave the nest or marry or act independently when they are adults do not love. They are selfish, driven by possessiveness. Those girlfriends and wives who suffer from jealousy are experiencing a similar type of love. It is nothing more than an excess of emotion, surpassing tolerance and goodwill. Excessive emotions usually reveal a failure in the development of intelligence. This may cause discomfort to those who proudly label themselves as highly emotional, as no one likes others to discover their lack of intelligence. However, an excess of emotion can reveal this. Every excess is bad, as it is proof that what counteracts it is lacking. Excessive heat, for example, is balanced by an equal amount of cold to make it bearable or unpleasant. Intelligence is cool, and emotion is warm. A great emotional capacity is a magnificent and desirable quality, as long as it is balanced with an equal intellectual capacity. This is what produces great artists. However, the artist has their art to pour all their emotional strength into. On the other hand, someone who is excessively emotional and has little intellectual development pours all their passion into the people around them, trying to control and make them follow their orders. The remedy for excessive emotionalism is to think and reflect a lot, especially meditate daily on intelligence. Start by asking what intelligence means, then consider that everything in the universe contains intelligence from plants to animals, and affirm, I am intelligent with the intelligence of God Himself, as I have been created from the very essence of the Creator by intelligence with the intelligence of God. Within a few days of repeating this practice, you'll notice a change in your mental flexibility and clarity. After just a week of practice, you'll observe a transformation in how you love others, a unique serenity, and an unprecedented generosity that you might not have believed possible. Simultaneously, you'll notice a complete change in how others respond to you, because we are indivisible individuals, and what affects one affects all. Every step you take upwards helps the entire human race. Now, let's address the number one enemy of humanity, resentment and grudge, not to mention hatred. Few humans are exempt from resentment, not knowing that it poisons their entire lives, influences negatively in all manifestations, and causes all the disappointments they suffer. Even when we learn to deny, affirm, know the truth, watch and correct our thoughts and words, a single resentment, a grudge engraved in the subconscious and the soul, acts like a tiny source of bitterness that stains everything. 
and astonishingly contradicts our greatest desires. Nothing, not even the most perfect manifestation, can endure as long as this infectious focus remains, spoiling our very being. The Bible, churches, and religions tirelessly advocate forgiveness and love towards our enemies, all in vain, until they teach us the practical way to impose forgiveness on those who hurt us. Often people say they forgive but cannot forget. This is a lie. As long as you remember a wrong, you haven't truly forgiven it. Let me provide you with an infallible formula for forgiving and forgetting at the same time for your own benefit. It places you at the point of equilibrium, that of tolerance and goodwill. And this effort is love. As the apostle of love, John says, love is the fulfillment of the law. Fulfilling the law of love is fulfilling all laws. It means being with God, in God, being happy, feeling content, and complete in all our manifestations. My teacher used to say, the man who loves well is the most powerful man in the world. Here is the recipe to love well. Every time you feel something unpleasant towards another person or find yourself resentful for something they have done, recognize that you have an open resentment or desires for revenge. Begin deliberately recalling, not trying to forget what happened, but remember all the good things you know about that person. Try to relive the pleasant moments you enjoyed in their company in the past before the moment they hurt you. Insist on remembering the good things, their positive qualities, the way you used to think of them. If you can laugh at a joke they told you or something fun you shared, the miracle is done. If one treatment isn't enough, repeat it as many times as necessary to erase the resentment or grudge. It's good to do it up to 70 times. This is the fulfillment of the law given by Jesus. Do not resist evil, which means turning the other cheek, loving our enemies, blessing those who curse us, doing good to those who hate us, and praying for those who insult and persecute us, all without exposing ourselves to being trampled upon. If you do it sincerely, you'll notice something strange. First, you'll feel liberated, and then a mountain of minor inconveniences that used to plague you and you didn't know the cause of will disappear as if by magic. You'll also notice that everyone, even those who didn't like you before, will show affection towards you. Now, let's talk about decrees, affirmations, or the technique of metaphysical treatments. What follows is learning how to formulate your prayers, what we call treatments in metaphysics. Since we're thinking and decreeing all day, we're praying negatively or positively all day, creating our own conditions, states, and events. The crucial aspect is to remain in the state of mind expressed by the prayer. If, after affirming, you allow yourself to return to the negative pole, you destroy the prayer's effect. Watch your thoughts and choose your words carefully. Don't be swayed by what others say, remembering that they may not know what you already know. Everything you think and ask for yourself, think and ask for others as well. We are all one in spirit, and this is the most effective way to give more than bread and alms. Bread and alms only last for a moment, while the truth remains with the other person forever. Sooner or later, your spiritual gift will enter your conscious mind, and you will have performed a saving deed for a brother. The principle of rhythm, which is the law of the pendulum, the boomerang, returns the good you do, just as it does the harm you do. It's been said that one with God is the majority. Thus, a single person who raises their consciousness to the spiritual plane and recognizes the truth as expressed above is capable of saving an organization from ruin, saving a community, a city, or a nation from any crisis as they operate on the spiritual plane, which is the truth, and the truth dominates all lower planes. Knowing the truth will set you free from your own or others' illness. I do not accept this appearance, neither for myself nor for anyone. I am life in you, in me, in the whole world. Thank you, Father, for having heard me. Repeat this affirmation every time the case that prompted you to express it comes to mind. In every case of fear, I do not accept fear. God is love. I am his child. I am love, made of love, and by love. Thank you, Father, for having heard me. In all cases of sorrow, mine or others, I do not accept it. I am joy. I am happiness. Start listing all the good things you have. Thank you, Father. In any case of scarcity, 
I do not accept this appearance. My world contains everything, and I am abundance. Thank you, Father, for today everything is covered. In the face of anything contrary to world or personal peace, I do not accept this appearance of conflict. I am peace, harmony, and order. We are all one. I forgive the Father, for they do not know what they are doing. I forgive everyone, and I forgive myself. Thank you, Father, for having heard me, and you always hear me. Metaphysics of the Ten Commandments Here we insert only two, the fifth and the sixth, among the laws called of God, which you will study when you feel like learning them. There is one called the Law of Correspondence, which has nothing to do with letters or mail. Correspondence means, in this case, what corresponds to something else, that is, it is equal. So, just as what is equal, let me explain. This law dictates that the conditions of each plane or state of consciousness are repeated everywhere, on all planes. For example, we always want to know what the characteristics of the afterlife are, let's say, that beyond always refers to the plane above the earth or the plane below the earth. The motto of this law is, as above, so below, and as below, so above. In other words, just like on earth, we have governments, schools, teachers, problems, and ways to resolve them. There are hands, feet, ears, eyes, sounds, time, space, flowers, and fruits. In short, you know what is meant. On every plane, everything corresponding to all these exists, even if those other planes are invisible to our earthly eyes. The only difference is that as you go up or down the planes, the conditions become finer and more powerful, and each lower plane is the foundation of the one above it, making it possible for us to affect and change our lives and those around us. As you ascend through the planes, the same conditions become less dense, more spacious, purer, more beautiful, more interesting, but also more complicated. This is because on each higher plane, there is an additional dimension compared to the one below. However, this doesn't mean it's difficult to live on the new plane after leaving the old one. It's not more challenging for a child to walk on their own after learning that nothing bad will happen when they let go. Now, let's get to the point. The fifth commandment on earth says, you shall not kill. This teaches us not to kill. It's not because someone tells you it's bad, you just shouldn't do it. On the higher plane, the commandment is the same. You shall not kill. No matter how hard you try, you will not only fail, but as the instrument cannot find anything to kill, it returns the way it came. You launched it, it hurts or strikes you, which you neither like nor find beneficial, and you won't try it again. You've learned not to kill. Now, let's turn to the sixth commandment. You shall not steal. It follows the same principle. On earth, we are taught not to steal because it's bad, but it may not be clear. On the higher plane, the commandment remains the same. You shall not steal what does not belong to you. Do not attempt it. You can obtain a similar object, but never the same. It won't stay with you and will return to its rightful owner. On earth, these commandments might seem like prohibitions, but on the higher plane, they are revealed as conditions laws and principles that cannot be violated. Nobody can kill you. Nobody can steal from you. You cannot kill anything or anyone. You cannot take what belongs to others and nobody can take what belongs to you. But that's not the only happiness. When you are on earth and are unable to kill or steal, you are prepared to learn the conditions of the other plane, called the plane of consciousness. When you learn the first lesson, you move on to learn the second. The great joy is that when you learn the second lesson, you don't need to have died or be on the other plane. You are very much alive and kicking here on earth. You apply the second lesson and are amazed to see that this law works for you both here on earth and in the heavens. In the higher plane, you are governed by the same law. You shall not kill, you shall not steal. Now you understand that these are not just prohibitions, they are conditions laws and principles that cannot be broken. Nobody can kill you. Nobody can steal from you. You cannot kill anything or anyone. You cannot take what belongs to others, and nobody can take what belongs to you. 
Now, let's explain why you cannot kill. This is because life is precisely that, life. It is not death, life cannot die as that would be a contradiction. Life is eternally life and can never be death. You might wonder what happens to you. You never die because you are alive. You are in eternity and nobody can take your life. Your life is God's and no one can take God's life so no one can kill you. This is why you cannot kill anyone as they, like you, are alive in eternity and no one can take their life. Now you might ask, why can't you steal? The reason this law works is simple. Imagine reaching a dead end if you still haven't accepted the law of reincarnation. It's okay. You can let it go if you don't like the idea of reincarnation. However, you won't progress. You'll remain stuck for the same reason that someone who refuses to accept that the sun will rise tomorrow would have to hide in a closet every morning and stay locked there during all daylight hours every day. The law of evolution is eternal experimentation and improvement. Everything changes from one thing to another, just like a child learning to walk, who shouldn't be afraid but should only learn to let go. You know that everything changes from one thing to another, like a child becoming a teenager, then an adult, and eventually an elderly person, leaving the old shell behind and finding a new one beyond. When a being dies, they find themselves in a new set of circumstances in the hereafter but they haven't lost any value. Abilities such as hearing, seeing, feeling, and the memories of their past experiences remain intact. You carry your knowledge, your character, and the consequences of your actions with you, which become part of your consciousness. Therefore, you can't steal what belongs to others, and nobody can take what belongs to you. In a sense, the fifth and sixth commandments teach us not to kill and not to steal, but on a deeper level, they show us the law of correspondence, where what you do to others is returned to you, either in this life or in future ones, as you continue your journey of evolution and spiritual growth. Understanding these laws and their deeper implications helps us live more consciously, harmoniously, and ethically. You possess certain faculties and abilities at each level, such as willpower, free will, the ability to communicate with others, your identity, and yourself. In contrast, as you move to a higher dimension, you see more, hear more, feel more, understand more, comprehend more, embrace more, and so on. In other words, you don't lose what you've acquired. It simply adapts to the new conditions of the plane. This means that on each plane, you gain new and greater abilities and knowledge. In each incarnated life, you acquire new experiences and learn to use new objects and instruments. Although they may be material on Earth, they have their counterparts in the invisible planes. You acquire these new abilities and knowledge over time, and in each life, you learn to use the tools and objects like cutlery, a bed, a match, and more. These have their counterparts on the other planes, don't forget that. These, being rightfully yours by the law of consciousness, as we say in metaphysics, automatically appear in your life, one after another. You can't be born into a family that doesn't have the means to provide you with what is rightfully yours by consciousness. Many times a child is born into a family lacking what is rightfully theirs, and soon the family acquires those things, seemingly by chance. That's why nobody can steal what is yours, and you can't take what you haven't earned or overcome in a previous life. The great happiness lies in knowing this law and these conditions. The law works in this earthly plane and all the other planes. Therefore, you can be sure that nobody can cause you losses or take anything away from you, not even your spouse. As long as you haven't done it to someone else, there's no reason to fear. So the way to live happily is to learn the metaphysics of the Ten Commandments. With this little gift that we offer, you've taken the first step towards happiness. I will never tire of recommending that you read this booklet constantly. Don't stash it away. Keep it in your pocket or wallet. Reread it if you can every day. Try to practice its instructions. Remember its guidance. And when you feel it's time to acquire more instruction, attend our conferences and get the following books. It won't cost you anything except for the books you choose to acquire, as we need to sell them to reproduce them.
Receive all our love. May the light of your beloved presence, your I am, envelop you, fill you, illuminate you, guide you, and accompany you. And that concludes our journey into the fascinating world of the Law of Attraction. Thank you for watching. To the receive a very powerful ancient technique to attract abundance, visit the link in the description of this video. And don't forget to subscribe.